Perfect. Thank you. All right. And so if we don't get to your question today, we're going to make sure we provide a, an answer to you and post that to the website um, by next by Wednesday of next week. And so we've also posted any questions and answers to questions we've received already on the website. We would have posted that onto the website as of, as of Wednesday of, um, of this week, so tomorrow. All right. So with that, let's go ahead and run the next section. So I just want to thank you all here for being with us today. As I noted, um, we've got the chat, chat box open. If you can, um, please enter your name, organizational affiliation, and or a book or podcast that you recommend. And with that, we're going to also, while you're doing that, we're going to open up this poll here so we can get an initial sense of just where folks are coming into this, this webinar. So we have a good feel for, for folks that are with us today. Let's go ahead and launch that first um, poll. And I just want to appreciate seeing some of these recommendations. Love in the time of cholera. I, I, I'm eager and interested to read that. Brief natural history of civilization. Pre appreciate that. The Overstory by Richard Powers. Okay. Thank you. Let's see if we've got a couple, few more folks uh, before we close out the poll and let and get give folks a sense for where folks are today. And just as a reminder, again. Please enter your question. Please enter your questions uh, into the chat box, or raise your hands, and we'll answer clarifying questions as we go. But we will have a, a section of this presentation towards the end that will be dedicated to just Q and A. And, and, and so we're going to some of those meatier questions. We're going to be putting them into our question stack, and we're going to be capturing them there, and then and, and then bringing them up at, during the Q and A section. So and, and we'll acknowledge that as, as we see your questions in the chat box. Let's go ahead and, and, and end the polling and share the results. So it looks like we've got about a fifth of folks here have read uh, the RFP material specific questions. We've got a major well, well majority of you all that have read some of the RFP material and are here to learn and, and, uh, and a few of you that have also not read the RFP material and are also here to learn. So that's great and appreciate just having a little of this insight into who we have here with us today. So I'm just going to go ahead and start out with some of these guiding principles. So the guiding principles were developed by the grant committee. Now the grant committee is a nine person volunteer committee, which ultimately will be the body that makes the final funding recommendations on what is going to be funded by the program. They're going to make those funding recommendations to city council. The grant committee, as part of their work, developed these set of guiding principles to guide the program. Anytime we come up with tough questions, whatever else, we come back to these guiding, guiding principles. These guiding principles describe the values by which the program is administered, and the guiding principles complement the legislative code that folks voted that, that, that voters voted in back in 2018. And the guiding principles help ensure that decisions are being made in a way that aligns with the vision and values of the committee as well as the community. Now, those guiding principles are that the program is justice driven, it is community powered, it is accountable, and is focused on climate action with multiple benefits. Now, this is just a little bit of an outline of what are the funding areas of that, of, of that, that PCF can fund, the program can fund. And these funding areas come specifically from the, the ballot initiative or the language that folks voted on back in 2018. Now, about what you see is roughly half of the funds will go towards clean energy projects. These are energy efficiency and renewable energy projects that are happening on residential buildings. So those include single family buildings, multifamily buildings, apartments. Um, these are, again, energy efficiency and renewable energy projects that happen on commercial buildings, industrial buildings, as well as schools. So um, that's, that's, the, that's the focus of that, that largest category of funding. Second largest category of funding is 20 to 25% that goes towards contractor training and support and workforce development, and this specifically in the clean energy sector. So this is about focusing and diversifying those that are getting to work on the project. So those that are actually swinging the hammers, doing the work, actually the trades work, as well as those that are getting to work, to work as energy auditors, those are getting to work as contractors on these projects. So it's about diversifying the sector and diversifying for women, people of color, folks with disabilities and others. The next sector is green infrastructure and regenerative agriculture. This is about your street trees, your bioswales, your green roofs, um, and as well as your urban agriculture plots um, and your community gardens. So it's really about supporting things that sequester greenhouse gas emissions or carbon in soils. 
So that's the, that's really the nexus. It's about growing things and sequestering carbon within soils. And this last category is innovation. And it's really kind of like the other category. It's, it's to invest in things that reduce greenhouse gas emissions, as well as advance racial and social justice, but that don't otherwise fit neatly into those other categories. Um, and so things that might not fit in these other categories, but otherwise meet those two uh, program goals would fall, could, could, could fall in the innovation category. Uh, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but this, this year, this, this particular allocation for this grant RFP or request for proposals or application period is 8.6 million next year and in future years it'll be 40 to 60 million. Now we just want to start with this initial bit around who is eligible to apply so that you know we ground this in sort of the, the, the basics. Um, you're eligible to apply if you are a nonprofit organization that is IRS tax exempt, registered as a nonprofit within the with the Secretary of State, um, as well as not on the disqualified charities list. Now, um, and that is that it, those those are the primary organizations that can apply. Those are the organizations that ultimately the city would have a grant agreement with, but we expect those organizations and encourage them to partner with other nonprofit organizations, to partner with for-profit organizations, as well as government. And so, but the primary applicant and the primary grant agreement and the relationship the city has is with the nonprofit organization that would apply. Now, the grant committee did anticipate and expected that a big part of this is increasing and expanding access to these sorts of resources and, this, and, and, and clean energy projects for a, a, a broader swath of the community. As part of that, we know a lot of those groups haven't necessarily incorporated as a nonprofit yet. And so we, they, they are allowing um, for groups of folks that are sort of are working with a charitable intent to work through and partner with a nonprofit fiscal sponsor to apply for funds. And so it's, it's not necessarily, like this, is, this isn't meant as a pass through for for-profit businesses, but in recognition that there's, you know, there's the, the group of folks that are gathering in a basement church that are working on their next wonderful idea and just haven't incorporated yet and they can partner and work through a nonprofit fiscal sponsor and access these funds as well. And we provide a little bit of guidance on what folks should be thinking about as they think about uh, fiscal sponsorships um, on our website under our additional resources tab. Um, and just so you know, this presentation uh, will also be posted online afterwards. So any of these links that you see here, you'll also be able to access afterwards. Now this year's solicitation is 8.6 million in, in funding availability. And of that, this just provides a little bit of an overview of what you expect to see in, in, in each of those funding categories. Um, and so you'll expect to see about three and a half to five million um, going towards those clean energy projects, about 840 to 1.3 million going towards green infrastructure or sustainable ag projects, 1.7 to 2.1 million for workforce development and contractor support. So I guess just a rough overview related to this, this year's solicitation around how much funding you should actually see based on some of those percentages um, that were noted earlier. Within that, there are three different types of grants folks may apply for. You can apply for a planning grant, a small grant, or a large grant. A planning grant is just that, it's a planning grant, and it's up to $100,000 each. Small grant is up to $200,000, and a large grant is $200,000 to a million. We do anticipate in future years that the large grant cap would be substantially higher than a million dollars, um, and that's gonna be a discussion and deliberation with the grant committee. Um, the one decision the grant committee did make related, the additional decision they made related to this year's solicitation is that they are going to allocate at least 1.5 million in total for planning grants, at least. And so um, that's to send a clear signal that if we have, you know, uh, $100,000, $1,500,000 proposals, that they would fund each of those. But that is by no, that is just the floor. They would, they will, they can fund more um, if they if they'd like to. And so they certainly want to see folks apply for planning grants in recognition that particularly communities of color and other historic and marginalized groups have not had access to planning resources. Okay, so this just this is a slide a little bit about the process that it's taken to get here. From the start of the initiative, PSEF has been a community led, a community originated initiative. And so we've carried that spirit through the development of PSEF and to what we've presented here with you today. So since the passage of the initiative back in November 2018, we appointed our grant committee um, in November 2019. The grant committee is majority POC, majority women. 
Um, and then they engaged in a whole series of briefings and eventually put out a set of guiding principles in March of 2020 for public comment and feedback from the public. We worked through that public comment and adopted those guiding principles in April of 2020, where through that period, they'd also begun working on the grant, um, the, the grant scoring criteria as well as the grant questions. So we released that for public comment in June of 2020, um, did heavy community engagement to solicit feedback and see what we got right, what we did and what we needed to adjust, made those, uh, made those adjustments and ultimately released the RFP in September 2020, September 16th, 2020. And so we're here in the middle right there at October, you know, right about a little bit over halfway through the RFP period. And the, this are, this, these applications themselves from this RFP period will be due November 16th. After those applications close, we will begin the eligibility review, the technical review, the scoring panel review, um, as well as, and then eventually bring those, the, the recommendations from the grant committee to city council in February, 2021, at which point we'll turn around and begin this process all over again, as we gear up to push out 40 to 60 million next year. I'm just gonna take a pause and see if I can open up my chat box and see if anything's coming up. So with that, uh, we'd like to just launch another poll and get a sense for what folks are interested in, whether you're interested in planning grants, small grants, or large grants. This gives a little description on the slide of what those are. Um, and want to acknowledge that folks can apply for multiple planning grants, multiple small grants, or multiple large grants. It's, it's about really the projects themselves being you know, individual projects. And then just a little a question about your experience in applying to grants. And do something here real quick and escape out of this view. I've got a while folks are answering this, maybe I'll wait till we, we finish this out. I'm gonna look at the questions that have been asked. Okay, I see the two questions here. I'll answer them in just a second. Okay, let's go ahead and close out the poll. Share the results. Okay, it looks like we've got a good distribution of interest across planning, small and large grants. So I feel like we struck this right in terms of the interest that uh, roughly half of folks are interested in each of those. And then, um, and we've got a, a varying varying level of experience in terms of planning grants. So. Hope you hope that we we will strike a little bit of balance for for everyone based on your your level of experience. So we've got a couple questions here um, in our question stack that I think I'll go ahead and answer. Question number one is what are the limits in the number of grant applications for the three grant categories? And I just want to say there there is no limit uh, in the number of grant applications for the three grant categories. It is a competitive grant solicitation, and so um, you know, and I will acknowledge that's probably made something harder. For, for us from a planning perspective, but there are no limits. And then from the RFP materials, this is the second question. It says, from the RFP materials, it seems like organizations can apply for multiple planning grants and are more limited in terms of the number of applications for small or large grants. That is, um, there is no limit. They can apply for, uh, folks can apply for multiple planning grants, multiple small grants, or multiple large grants. Um, the only, the only thing that is, um, let me, let me give the, the only criteria I think I would add to that is that the, the projects you, you can't submit the same projects for a small grant and a large grant, trying to gauge which one you would, it ha they have to be different distinct projects that you're applying for, for each of those. Um, and so I know that is, there's been other questions that have come to us before around whether someone should bundle one large project that includes, includes multiple different components or separated apart. And that really is, it's, it's really a question for the grant applicant to, to think through whether that sort of a project really can only happen as one project together and all the components are, are, are critical for that project to happen or whether you can, they are distinct projects. And so ultimately those, those are questions um, for, for the organizations to think through. Okay. All right, I'm gonna go back to our presentation here. Okay, 
So we're going to go ahead and move on to the next slide. So now we're moving into what it means to just navigate the application process. And we're, we're providing this guidance because there's, there's quite a bit of materials and we want to make sure folks feel as prepared as possible and know where the content is as they think through their applications and know where the resources are so that they can, they can navigate that as you all have questions as you work through your applications. So again, we will send this set of slides out. So if you have questions, you will be able to reference this back out and we'll send it, we'll make sure we get this out soon. So the first place, and we anticipate if for many of you all that are here in this webinar, you probably have gone to this website already, um, as this is one of the places you can go to access this webinar. But this is our landing page for the grant. It's the guide to the PS PSAF grant application process. On this page is a sort of table of contents, and it contains important dates you need to be aware of. It contains eligibility, so who can apply for PSAF grant. We talked about that earlier. It contains information on PSAF priority populations, the funding categories, the grant types, the uses of funds, and that's going to really be a really important place for folks to look back to. Um, the application review process, what it means to receive a grant, reporting requirements, some helpful links, as well as translations of this guide page into nine other languages. Uh, to the top right of this page, there's a few different sections of this guide that you can also navigate to for additional information, and it's worth exploring that as well. Maybe before I even move to this, I would say before you start working on your grant application itself, it's really important you read through the entirety of this guide. There's, just, there's a lot of content that's going to be really relevant as you think, as you just even begin to think about your proposal and your application, that it's really important. It's not, it's certainly comprehensive. It's not too long, but it's really important that you just read through all of this as it's important framing context to think about your project. Now to the top right, we've got this section, and one of the sections is questions about PSAF grants. Throughout this RFP period, we've hosted webinars, co-hosted webinars with culturally specific organizations and others, um, and we've taken questions via email, via one-on-ones, through phone calls. And as we've done that, any question that has come up that hasn't been clearly answered before or isn't very, you know, isn't just go look at this section, we've made sure to take that question down answer that question and post those questions as well as answers onto this page. And so you'll see it's, it's become a, you know, now that we're in our fifth week, it's become a pretty long list. Um, but it, we really recommend that you go through here and you scan some of the questions because you'll see that some of the questions you have, others have already asked. And so all of those questions that have been asked week to week have been posted here and this page gets updated weekly on Wednesdays. And so the questions you all ask, Today will also be posted on here next week. This next tab is just webinars and technical assistance. The webinars, you're in one, so those are no different than what, you, what we're in here today, but the technical assistance are trainings that we separately provided and we've contracted around uh, grant development um, and budget development. So if you've got questions about those or just want to brief, you know, sharpen your skills up a little bit, it's an important place to go and sign up for one of those technical assistance webinars. So we still have several left. Lastly, there's an additional, or not lastly, one more to last. There's an additional resources tab, and this is just a curated list of links around information that, that could be helpful for your application um, as you think about and as you have questions. And then there's a definitions tab. There's a lot of terms that we introduce or we mention frequently within this RFP or application. Um, and so it's important that you know that it's there and you keep that handy so that as you see different terms you may not be familiar with, you can, you can chime back in. Um, this is one particular definition we've highlighted here is that we've got priority, you know, different priority populations called out within the initiative and within this application. And so um, there's really two sets of priority populations defined in the PCEF code. And in, in those priority populations, it depends on the type of project you're, you're working on. So one, if you have a clean energy, a green infrastructure, regenerative agriculture project, the priority population is going to be people of color or people with low income. So as we reference and say, what are your, you know, are you working on priority population? It's important that you know that as you're working on one of those infrastructure projects that are benefiting people, those are the two priority populations, people of color or low income people. Now, if you're working on a workforce development or a contractor support project, the priority population is a little bit broader. That all It includes their women, people of color, people with disabilities, and people who are chronically underemployed. So just keep that note as you're, as you're depending on the type of project you have, there are different priority populations. And 
those priority populations are relevant because you get more points for benefiting and serving a priority population. Once you've scrolled through and worked all the way through that first uh, guide page and scanned some of the questions as well as definitions and whatnot, then you can go to the next page, which is where you actually begin to get ready to apply for a PCF grant. You know, you've reviewed that content and you said you're ready. So the next page, you're gonna choose what type of grant, whether it's a planning grant, a small grant or a large grant. And then you scroll down a little bit and you're gonna actually be sent to an, a place where you're gonna download a different packet of material that are gonna be relevant for your development of that application. So if you're applying for a planning grant, there's a link, small grant or large grant, and you may download each of those packets if you're applying for all of those. What that, what that link is going to do is it's gonna send you out to another folder, another page at the, right here at the top uh, left of that page, there's a little download icon. That download will let you download an entire zip folder. And that zip folder will contain all the materials you need to get ready for that application. So what it contains is an application checklist, uh, the actual application questions and a guidance document and additional resources and required attachments that will be required for your application. It's really important that as you work through your application, you really work through this application packet and use this before you move to actually submitting through our online portal, which we will move to shortly. Now we know that not everyone learns or works through things by viewing them on a computer screen. So if you do need and, and may not have access to a printer, so if you do need printed materials, you do need to just email us and we will happily mail you uh, a printed copy or hard copies of any one of these grant application materials. We, may, we do our mailings we once weekly. Once you've gone through the entirety of the application packet materials and you've developed your answers, and we're gonna speak a little bit more on that later, then you can move to actually submitting your application through an online portal. You'd move next and you'd click this online portal this online portal is strictly just a place where you can submit your application. It's not a place where we recommend that people actually work on their application because um, we think it's more durable to work in either Microsoft Word, or Google Docs. It really wasn't designed as a place to work on your application. There is no spell checking there, for instance, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But um, similarly, if you would not like to submit your application to the portal, but you want to instead submit it via hard copy and mail it in, or you want to email your application, you can do that. So you can do that too. You just need to contact and let us know. Okay. So now we're going to dig into the more detailed bits of the application materials so that you have a sense for what's actually in there. And, and maybe that'll, that'll prime and, and support some of the questions you may have. So as I noted, there's an application packet for large grants, small grants, of, and planning grants. And in, within each application packet, there is sort of the, 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 at the main page, there's a checklist, there's a, the guidance, uh, a, a guidance document, and then the actual questions themselves. Um, there's a folder that has required attachments. Within that folder, it's, you know, if you're applying for a, a, a large grant, there's two, there's two required attachments. There's the budget required attachment, as well as there's the milestone and activity spreadsheet required attachment. But there's also a document that lets you know information that must be included in your scope, and that's attachment A. And, and that is less something you would attach but it's a reference document of information you have to include as part of your scope in your application. Um, similar sort of file folder for um, small grants and for planning grants, there's just um, really one required attachment that's the, the, the budget template itself. This just gives you, this dials down into outside of that required attachments, there's a resources folder. And in that resources folder, it's simply that these are, this is information that will help you understand the program and what you're getting into. So it's really recommend that you take a look at that. Um, and I'll pause here and take a, take a look at some questions in a second. But uh, there are clean energy project requirements. These are their, how we're going to evaluate greenhouse gas impact. Um, there's a reporting requirements, sample grant agreement, um, wage requirements, as well as workforce and contractor equity uh, template agreement requirements. Um, and so. Again, those are documents that as you think about your, the project you're engaging in, it's worthwhile to look at those since those are elements of the, you know, whether it's a grant agreement that you'd be expected to sign on us, there's details in there that are going to be helpful for your review as you think about your application itself. Okay, I'm going to pause here and I'm going to take a look at our questions. Let's see here. 
So we've got the, what is the one question we've got in the question stack? And maybe, you know, I'm gonna hold on to these questions because I don't think these are as clarifying. So I'm gonna hold on to these questions until we get to the end. Okay. Oh, I do see, we do see the questions though. Okay. And this is just a screenshot of two different sections of the application. This is, whichever screenshot is, this is the application questions that this is the PDF that would live within the, the packet of information you download. And so it shows you the questions that you're expected to answer. And we show you those so that you can take those questions and you can work on them in a Word platform, Microsoft Word, Google Docs, or whatever is your preference. And you work on the questions and answer those questions before you begin and, 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 and input those questions into the application portal. But you'll see that the application portal follows a very similar arrangement orientation. The difference is some things are just automated. There's skip patterns in the application, which in a PDF, there the skip pattern you sort of read it and it says skip to this question. In our application, it's a little bit more automated for you. Okay. This is a little bit on attachment A, which I referenced. This is really only relevant if you're doing a small grant or a large grant, and it contains different bits of information that are required if you're doing a renewable energy project, an energy efficiency project, a green infrastructure project or a regenerative ag project or workforce or contractor development project. So it includes sort of the baseline information. And this is all really for the most part, basic information that would be expected if you were doing a renewable energy project, we'd expect you to tell us what is gonna be the installed capacity? What is the energy, is there energy storage? You know, what is, what are you going to be, how many buildings are being served by the project? Those sort of, that sort of basic information. And so this is information that's worthwhile to review as you think about your project type. In fact, it's critical you review it because we ask for this information to be included in your scope so that we can properly evaluate your proposal. This is just a screenshot of attachment B. This is the budget template for small and large grants. We'll show you the budget template for planning grants in a second. So what you'll see here is that there are really three tables to be aware of. There's two tabs, there's a leverage tab, and which has a leverage table. That's where you include any information on any leverage that's gonna be included as part of your grant application. Certainly not required, but there is some, um, there are some points for leverage. Um, and then there's um, a project budget table as well as a personnel table, which you don't see here, but it's a little further below on this, on this tab. Um, and you'll see that there are formulas in here and the, the sheet is locked. So any cell that isn't clear, you, you cannot enter information into there. It's just automatically, there are automatic formulas for it. Um, however, anyone that's savvy enough can certainly unlock that and look at the formulas. We just ask that you, you don't adjust the formulas. It's, it's really there so that we, we're able to make sure everything is consistent across these applications. And then here's just the, the budget template for the planning grant. You'll see it's just more simple, but really just includes a basic set of information. We know that some folks are gonna to wanna to include a lot more detail as part of their budget. And we just ask that you put that sort of, you know, you, you detail or provide any explanation in the description box and you're not limited. We welcome you to provide as much or as little description as you want. And as, I, um, as I'm saying that, I recall that I didn't say this earlier, throughout the application itself, there are plenty of places where we provide word suggestions um, it'll be usually in purple in the application. It'll say something like 100 to 200 words. Those are purely suggestions. Um, and, and it's really to provide some folks just a sense of uh, what you can expect. But we know that some folks will need more, you know, more room to, to describe what they want to say. And we welcome that. And there's no penalty or penalizing. And some folks will need less. And that, that's perfectly okay. Okay. I'm just going to go through a few budget tips and reminders here before we talk about some of the uses of funds and another section. One you need to know is that PCEF is not lowest cost wins program. Please ask us what you need, you know, you know submit for a budget to, that you need to complete your project. We want to know what do you need to complete your project or proposal as, as, you, as you deem fit. If you're doing a construction project, please remember to include contingency. Five to 10% is standard, but it's important you can include that in contingency. If your project is a multi-year project, um, please make sure that you're budgeting enough money to meet the PCEF minimum wage requirements in all years. So if you're budgeting for your staff well above the PCEF wage requirements, it's gonna be less relevant, but if you're budgeting at the wage requirements, um, which as of July 1st of this year is 23.85, it's important that for all subsequent years that you're at least you're accounting for your budget going up by the minimum wage going up since it's 100%, 180% of minimum wage, and that increases each year. 
So we have a little table in our wage requirements table. Pay attention to caps. There's an overhead cap of 20% of the project cost, a fiscal sponsor fee of 10% of the project cost. And if you have a fiscal sponsor, the combined, the combined cap on your fiscal sponsor as well as overhead is 25%. Um, and then um, if you have a construction budget, you know, if you have a construction project, note that up to 30% of the project cost can be spent on non-energy related building improvements. So whether that is replacing a roof, whether that is addressing wiring before you're doing some insulation work or whatever else, that, 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 that's the cap there. And this is just a question that comes up a lot um, is around how grants can be paid. Um, and this, you, you can see this within the sample grant agreement, but if you receive a grant, we will begin grant negotiations around your grant agreement. And that's where we will determine whether we will be paying you through partial reimbursements on a quarterly basis or, or, or sorry, partial reimbursements on a monthly or whatever appropriate basis, or whether we are going to go through and do a partial advance payment. We do not expect to do full advances, but we do anticipate partial advances. Okay. And maybe this is going to be, a, I'm going to try to pull up my chat and see what questions we've got going here. Before I go on to this slide, I'm going to go ahead and see our questions because maybe an important time to get some clarifying questions out of the way. Okay. Okay, maybe I'm going to go ahead and answer this second question that we've taken down in our question stack. Um, it says, particularly for multi-year projects, is there a standardized period of reporting and payout, or are these distinct to unique MOUs for each project? So yes, we generally, you know, we have a general, like we provide a general guidance around what we expect within our reporting, but we do, uh, and we will, you know, once you get a grant awarded to you, you will be assigned a grant project manager and you will begin negotiations with that grant project manager around what is exactly the, the expected reporting requirements for your particular grant type, as well as what will be the, the disbursement schedule for your particular grant type. So that is based on um, a negotiation uh, with each grant recipient. But hopefully we've provided some sense and there's a reporting requirement, some high level sense of what you're going to be expected to report on, um, as well as within the sample grant agreement, there's um, language around the, the, the disbursement schedule. And so you can get a sense for what are the various options for disbursement, which I just spoke to. Okay. This next slide speaks to the uses of funds. And so we're calling attention to these elements, mainly so that you'll know what is allowed and what is limited, and be encouraged to think creatively about how you meet environmental, racial, and social justice goals. I want to acknowledge that this list around use of funds, this is a smaller list than what is on the website on the guide page, so it's important to look there, but that this list is not exhaustive. It lists some things that are eligible, and we wanted to call attention to those because folks may not think they're eligible, and it lists things that are not eligible. But again, on either end, it is not exhaustive. There are going to be more things that are going to be eligible, and there are probably more things that are not eligible, but we want to provide a, some, some sense on the uses of funds. And so please ask us questions if it sort of isn't captured here um, as you go through this. So one is that we do expect project reporting costs to be uh, a, an eligible expense. Um, there are rent stability measures that are required within the program if you are investing in um, investing in buildings or any building with tenants. Um, material supplies and equipment purchases are eligible. Land acquisition is eligible as long as that land acquisition is directly related to um, any one of the funding categories. So it's directly used for a green infrastructure. It's directly related to renewable energy and installation, but if it's sort of indirectly related, it is not eligible. Transfer of property is, is eligible, um, allowed. Building improvements are allowed. Um, and you know, building improvements that are not strictly energy efficient to renewable energy are allowed up to that 30% cap. Expenses associated with maintaining an investment are allowed. Uh, reimbursement for items procured or work completed prior to the effective date of the grant is not allowed. Items to support necessary uh, items necessary to support recruitment, retention, and success of participants in workforce development is allowed. So whether that is childcare expenses or travel expenses or other things like that. 
items necessary for, uh, for businesses starting or scaling up, and then um, capitalizing a loan program, as well as any insurance costs that are, um, that are required as a result of participating in the program. So um, obviously any, any existing insurance obligations you're required to carry would be just care captured as part of your overhead, but any new additional insurance costs that you're required to take on because of PSEF would be an eligible expense. And I'm going to pause there because I know oftentimes this brings up questions and I'm going to see if I can open up my chat box. Okay, we can, we'll come back to this because I suppose I expect this to raise questions. Okay. This slide is just a little screenshot of the milestones and activities template that is going to be, that is required for any small or large grant. Milestones is where we expect you to enter the milestones and define a milestone, the start and end date for that milestone. So it's, it's subjective, but it really is just a significant marker in the project that indicates completion of a major event, decision point, stage, or goal. Then activities are just um, specific activities that would, uh, that would be funded that will lead to achieving each of these milestones. And so there's sort of milestone at the level and individual activities that would support reaching that milestone and goal so that you have a sense for how these would be used. It's uh, our, our project managers that will be assigned to you to be working through these activities and likely using these to build these as part of your scope requirements within your grant agreement with the city. Just going to speak to a little bit about the application portal and then we'll get to the Q&A. So when you get to the application portal itself, you'll see that there are what you see to the right here is this dialog box. You're going to need to create a login address, a login with an email address as well as a password. So you'll create that. Um, if you are working on your application and multiple folks are going to be working on inputting your application into the application portal, it's important that you, you share an email, you know, use an email address and a password that, that and multiple folks will be able to use that and log in with that. So it's just one per application or per organization really is one login and one email address. On the left side, you'll see that this is um, this is the main page and sort of the landing page for the application. And here, this is just a uh, demonstration a demonstration login, but we've created three different application types. This is as if the person was applying to a small grant and two planning grants. And so for each application, they'll have a title for the project. And this is just where as you get out of your project itself, you can save your status. And as you log back in, you can come back in and click on the project and pick up where you left off and continue to work on it. Um, one important thing to know is multiple folks should not be even if you as an organization are sharing your email address across multiple folks to input this information into the portal, it's important that two people are not in this at the same time. This just gives a little overview. Once you get in the first section is the applicant eligibility and you'll start with, and, and just in order to create sort of a project, you'll need to give it an application title. And so that's where, this is where you'd first start in. If you, as you come into a small grant, you'd have to give it an application title. Just a few tips and reminders. Again, this is the last step. It's really, really important that you download and review the complete application materials before starting in the portal. We strongly recommend that you type your grant application in text documents such as Word or Google Docs so that you have a backup. And then once you complete all those answers that you're actually cutting and pasting your responses into the appropriate response field in the application portal. Again, the, the portal itself does not have spell check or anything else like that. So it's just important you work elsewhere. You can apply for multiple grant projects under one account. Save your application from time to time during complete, you know, as, as you're working through the portal. It's not automatically saved, so it's important that you're, as you're getting through each section, you're saving from time to time. And if you're sharing login information, do not use the application portal at the same time. And so with that, I am going to open up the, I'm going to pull open the chat box for myself, and I am going to, one second, I'm going to open up the Redoc. Okay. So and we ask, please raise your hand if you like, but I'm going to start going through um, questions that were asked um, throughout the presentation. So this first question is, would compost fall under renewable ag or workforce development? And so I might, if the person that asked that, I might ask to get a little bit more of an explanation <laughs> if we can, because I guess just from would compost, that, that I don't know if I have enough information. It really is maybe on what I'll just speak to is, on regenerative agriculture, for instance, it really needs to be that you're 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 doing some sort of agricultural practice that is leading to you know that is leading to sequestering more carbon within the soil. So generally, that's 
sustainable ag practices, whether that is no-till agriculture or other practices that are resulting in greater sequestration of carbon in the soil. So that's what regenerative agriculture is generally. And there's, there's a broader set of principles that fall under that or broader set of practices that fall under regenerative agriculture. That's so, but when I come back to regenerative ag and, and green infrastructure, it is really about the practices that you're engaging in that are leading to greater sequestration of carbon in soils. Um, and so, I'm just, let's see, it looks like there may be a follow-up chat to that. Got it. Okay, the question is, they're, um, working with a local BIPOC waste hauler to provide composting services to an area that does not receive it. So, that would, frankly, probably fall within innovation. Um, so the question, oh, did we, did we get, uh, did, the, did the person get un uh, unmuted? Okay. Let's see. So what I'll share is uh, on that particular one, um, if someone was working with a local BIPOC waste hauler to provide composting services to an area that, the, that does not receive it, that's the, that is the full question there, or the full context. Um, what, what funding category or working on that kind of project, what funding category would that fall under? And to the extent that there's a workforce development component to that, it's certainly part of that, the workforce development related bit of that project could be funded under the workforce development funds. However, other parts of that project are likely gonna be in the innovation category. And so it's just gonna be important to speak to what are the GHG savings and then what are the racial and social justice benefits associated with that project? Okay, I'm gonna keep going down the question stack here. Next question is, um, or comment is, I was hoping to hire a student intern through PSEF funds. PSU actually caps their wage at about $18 per hour and their hours to 0.5 full-time equivalent. But we would be helping subsidize their tuition through the partnership. Would that be a violation of PSEF minimum wage requirements? It's not, it's, it's not so much a requirement of PSEF that PSEF be the funds that are paying the entirety of their wages. However, anyone working and receiving any, you know, working and receiving any compensation through PSEF, so working on a PSEF project has to be paid a minimum of, I'd say right now, again, if that was taking, up, taking place up through July or up to June 30th, 2021, it would have to be paid a minimum of 2385. Uh, volunteers are not subject to that, but um, anyone that is being paid as an employee must be paid at least that much. So I think it's, if you were subsidizing their PSU wages and adding on to that and getting them to over 2385, that would be okay. I hope that that gets to that. And please, if, if not, please raise your hand and we can, we can call on you or you can ask it again in the chat box. Is the organization, next question is, is the organization with the, with the grant portal login automatically the lead on the grant? Also, my organization has many departments that will apply. Is it acceptable for us to have different logins for our organization? So one, Yes, the organization that would be applying to the portal login is the lead. I mean, we specifically ask for them to um, to sign their their application. So the they, they expect, expectation it is the lead that is applying to the portal and that is submitting the application itself. And that that is, and then we take that information and we will ultimately work on the, the grant agreement. So yes, that's that first bit of the question. And then the, the second question: an organization can have multiple logins as well as um, apply through apply for grants from an from a specific organization from multiple different individuals in that organization. What you will see though, is that there are several questions that will be important that, I mean, there's several questions, organizational questions that we ask. And so it's just important that you know that those are the same questions and they're gonna be consistent across applications around who is, who is, the, you know, who is, the, who is the president, executive director of the organization, questions about the board, questions about the staff, the senior leadership, the makeup and the demographic makeup of your staff and senior leadership, um, mission questions. So some of the basic questions are there. So I just want to acknowledge that they're the that you, you at least may want to be working closely to you're answering some of those basic questions um, consistently. Okay. Let's see. Would researching and securing project partners for a future small grant or large grant be an appropriate use of a planning grant? Yes. 
answer to that is yes. The next question is, would electric vehicles or charging stations be an eligible project under either clean energy or green infrastructure? So as it stands now, and this is partially the, the way we've uh, interpreted the initiative language, electric vehicle infrastructures or electric vehicles projects would fall under the innovation category. It would neither clean energy is really, it's, it's focused on building energy efficiency or building renewable energy, uh, building energy efficiency or renewable energy. And so community solar could certainly fall under clean energy, but um, in green infrastructure, again, it, the nexus has to be with uh, greenhouse gas sequestration in soils within Portland. I think there's more questions scrolling through. Okay. If a community organizing project starts early January with other foundation funding, can the piece of allocated expenses be covered starting in February for that same project? Yes. I mean, I, the, the, the key part is we're going to be asking, well, what is additional that we are funding? We don't it's um, and this will be related to as you apply for future PCEF grants. This year, you may put in an application to weatherize 50 homes, and then two years from now, you come in and you put in another application, and you're going to be doing it's it's going to be a growth of the exact same program, but instead, we're we're going to be asking okay, how many additional homes are you going to weatherize as a result of this application? So you can't be using it to backfill existing but existing piece existing funds. Uh, where you've already got an allocation from the program. Um, and so uh, it, 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 the community PSEF can fund um, project expenses with a project that's already begun. That's already begun, but moving forward from that date, it, we wouldn't retroactively fund any prior expenses uh, that, that were accrued prior to signing a grant agreement. Does a community organizing project need to create outputs and or outcomes that reflect future capital investments, for example, solar installation or community or can the community organizing outcomes reflect increased capacity of local residents to take the lead on climate justice issues at the local level, whatever those might be. This is a uh, very, they, a project does not explicitly need to result in the installation of physical infrastructure. However, you do need to be able to describe how or how you are, um, how your project is likely to reduce greenhouse gas emissions benefits as well as um, create racial and social justice benefits. So it's really articulating those things. But for instance, we do expect um, uh, conservation education programs to be eligible. Now, those don't result in installation of anything, but they result in folks using less energy because they're operating their buildings or whatever else better. And so conservation education is certainly, and those sorts of things are all just needing to be able to speak to the connection to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, as well as um, creating racial and social justice benefits. Would the purchase, this next question is, would the purchase of a 12 passenger van to address transportation access to nature-based activities and spaces be an appropriate use of small grant or large grant funding? On the face of it, I don't think so. Um, and I'm, as I'm reading that, I'm just the question, I'm, and the question I, it really is to you, and it, it, it's us me, but it's how is that project reducing greenhouse gas emissions um, and creating racial and social justice benefits. So it really is both of those. Um, and what and this is what I see here is this is about increasing access to nature-based activities, but I don't necessarily see the direct link to greenhouse gas emissions. And if there's more clarifying around that, please please do let us know. I can see. Okay. 
got another question here. And so it starts with a comment. The effective hourly rate for Portland State University's diversity award is 2404. What, what we pay would reflect 2404 per hour to PSU, and they pay the student after taking matching, so after taking or, or matching funds. Would this meet the PCEF wage requirements of 2385? The individual needs to be paid at least 2385 an hour. So it's if if PSU is receiving that set of funds, but then you know taking out their administrative overhead or benefits wage benefits or anything else, and, and the wage itself again exclus, excluding benefits, but the wage itself is lower than 2385, then that would not meet the wage requirement. So the, the you know the the individual needs to be receiving at least 2385 an hour. Um, pre pre you know pre you know pre tax deductions and, and other things. And and I will acknowledge the the wage requirements are going to be an interesting thing that we're going to tease through. But that's that's something that was very clearly. Um, called out within the ballot initiative and it's something that we will we will get a better sense for what that means we, we know that it's certainly going to be probably more challenging for certain sectors um, probably green infrastructure and regenerative ag than, than others but um, it's something that it, it's not something that we haven't heard about it's just it's a reality of sort of what the folks voted on and what, and, and what were required by by statute to implement Are applicant board approval financial statements or audit of 50C? Yeah, I'm assuming there's independent audit of 50C3 required. Um, we do require board approved financial statements. We do not require an, uh, an independent audit of the 501C3 budget. Um, we will ask for it if you have it. Um, and once you, are re once you do receive a grant agreement with us, that, that will be a future requirement that you do have indep independent audits of your, of your financial statements. So, um, so we do require board approved financial statements to be submitted as part of your application. Um, we do not require audited 501c3 um, financials um, as part of your application. If you have them, we do want them submitted. Um, but once you do receive a grant agreement from us, that would be an expectation moving forward. So next question. Would administrative fees around the sponsorship of a workforce visa be covered by PCEF? So personal expenses are clearly a called out category. And so you, we expect you to list your personal expenses and those are obviously the wages and whatever else. And then administrative expenses that, that specifically individually isn't called out, but we do have overhead um, and overhead allotment. And so, and, and for personnel, the overhead allotment is 20%. And so if that is captured within your 20% overhead um, uh, um, uh, allotment, then it's fine, but not, not as an individual line item, no. Here. Maybe my, my document may not be refreshing as quickly. If a fiscally sponsored project is brand new and no financial reports have been created, how do we meet that requirement? So the, the financial a fiscally sponsored project, we would expect the financials of the fiscally, fiscally the, the sponsoring organization or sponsoring nonprofit. Ultimately, they are going to be the body that is responsible for, you know, they are the ones that would be signing the grant agreements with the city itself. They are the body that is responsible for making sure that those grant agreements are met. And so we are going to be looking at their financials. So it isn't, it isn't a requirement that uh, a new uh, a new organization or new body that's being fiscally sponsored have all that set of financials. We do not expect that, and we ex and 
and there may be a nonprofit that is only in and around for a couple of years, but we do expect to see whatever financials they've they've gotten up until that point. Got this question from Leslie. Can I apply for a small green infrastructure grant for landscaping? So trees, previous pavers, pervious pavers on a new site, even if some of the landscaping is required by the city for the development. This is a good question. Generally speaking, and it may be that we may need, I mean, we may need to come back to this question, Leslie. Generally speaking, those, those pieces, you, you could apply for that, but what we're requiring, and this is, for instance, for clean energy, is if you're doing a new project, a new building, we, we, do not, we will not be paying for things that are already required by, by state energy code. We will be paying for things that go in above and beyond the state energy code, in part because those are already required. And so I want to I wanna ask, it may be, Leslie, that we need to follow up with you. I mean, if you have an email address, I'd really appreciate you sending that directly to our, to our team so we can get a little bit more information about that particular question. And you may just want to email us at cleanenergyfund at portlandoregon.gov. So that's that's one I'm not sure about. It may just be we need a little bit more information on is what I'm sort of getting at there. Okay. Okay, we're gonna wait here and see if any other questions come up. Just really appreciate these, and these are great questions. And we'll certainly be here until until it gets until things go real quiet. But um, please let us know if there are any other questions. I think we're going to go ahead and it would be great before we lose all you all. I think um, we're going to go ahead and launch the last poll just to get, and this is not to say we're closing this out. You don't have to go away just yet, but we'd love to just get a little bit of feedback around how this webinar went for you and, and how, how likely after hearing this webinar are you um, to apply. At least having 10 of you participate. Looks like, um, let's see if we got a couple more and then we'll share the results here. Let's go ahead and end the polling to share the results. Thank you. So looks like, um, fortunately, this has been helpful for most, of, for, for most folks on the call and that we've got a little bit of a split between folks being um, very likely to apply and happy to hear that, somewhat likely and unsure. And so as you all, have those questions that are coming up. And if you feel like we didn't quite answer those, please do reach out. Um, we are working to make sure we get back to folks within uh, at least 24 hours, giving them a little feedback. And it may be that we need to think a little bit more on your questions, um, but please do give us a call. And we're happy to spend a little bit more time as we know the particulars of each ID and each grant are always going to be different. Um, and so really appreciate this. And Leslie, I appreciate that we've got, got, I've got your email and we'll make sure we follow up so that we can get a better sense on your, your points are on. Uh, the green infrastructure. Okay. All right. 
Thank you all. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Jen, for joining. We know some of you had to log off. We'll stay on for another couple of minutes in case a question comes up. But again, um, I'm going to make sure you see our email flip through. These next slides aren't really as. Ta -ta -ta. Let's make sure. Okay, I'm just going to keep this here. So you see the additional assistance, and really just there's that there's that email addresses as well as that number down below. Please, if you have additional questions, um, we'll, and I'll, I'll I'll follow back up with you, Leslie. But please email those to Clean Energy Fund at Portland, Oregon .gov. And check out the, the the questions that have already been asked as well as answered on the Q and A section of the the guide page. Okay. We're going to give it about another 30 seconds here before we close it out. And so at this point, we might be saying you don't have to, <laughs> you don't have to go away, but you will, you will get booted from here. <laughs> but I want to, um, I want to thank our captioner for captioning this meeting for us. I know that always helps in, in, in making things a little bit as you, as you as, for all the folks that aren't necessarily, um, verbal processes. So I want to thank you today. And thank Wendy, June, Janet for being on this call on the team. With that, then let's go ahead and I'm going to stop my screen share. Um, and let's go ahead and stop recording the meeting. And uh, we're going to go.